will uh, be available for uh, downloading at a later date. Uh, but just so you know, you are being recorded. And then of course we have another cadre of uh, options for Angela answers for the remaining of 2022. And then of course we're looking for 23 presentations uh, at this point. At this point, it gives me great honor to introduce to, to you, Nikki Scott. Nikki is, as I mentioned, on our caregiving team here at Angela Hospice. And for those of you who don't know, uh, this month, uh, November, is National Family Caregivers Awareness Month. So we thought it would be very appropriate for Nikki to speak to us about how to care for the caregivers. So without any further ado, an exciting presentation awaits you. I'll turn it over to Nikki. Thanks so much, Nikki. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really honored to, to have been asked to give this presentation on care for the caregiver. My name is Nikki Scott. Um, I've been with Angela Hospice for 10 years. Um, so not only is it Family Caregiver Awareness Month, it's also National Hospice Month as well. Um, so we're celebrating family caregivers as well as hospice team members. Um, I've worked as a social worker in every aspect of hospice um, in my 10 years here from care center to admissions in the field, home care, um, weekends. I've done, I was a home care case manager for many years. And then just last year, I transitioned over to our grief care department where I'm now a full-time grief counselor. Absolutely love my role as a grief counselor. Um, and also seeing the, the other side of caregiving, um, the aftermath of losing our loved ones. Um, so with my 10 years, I've seen many family caregivers, many dynamics, um, many different things too. Um, so I want to thank you. Um, if you've been a caregiver, if you're currently a caregiver, or you'll be a caregiver in the future, which you're more than likely to for a family member. Um, before I get started with my, my PowerPoint here, I have a desk calendar here in my office, and it was really fitting that over the weekend I came in to find um, the quote from this last weekend, the 12th and 13th, was about caregiving. So I thought that was a pretty neat sign. Um, it says, Caregiving is an act of celebration, which nurtures each other's best traits while healing our worst. It's a remembrance that others' shortcomings may mirror our own. It's knowing that communication is more listening than speaking. It's giving and receiving cleaner, clearer expressions of love in its limitless forms. And that's by Eric Allen. So I'm gonna get started here with our agenda. Um, so I just went over the introduction. I'm gonna be going over some family caregiving um, definitions and, and different types of family caregiving, um, caregiving statistics, caregiving tasks, what caregiving looks like in the future, um, some of the negative impacts of family caregiving, um, one of them being burnout, some free tools that I've found that might help you if you're currently a family caregiver. Um, and then I'm going to get into caring for the caregiver, which is self-care, um, something that I've been studying for many years. And then we're going to end with a guided meditation specifically for caregivers and open it to questions and answers. Um, so inter in, an introduction here, a definition, a uh, family caregiver is someone who provides emotional, financial, nursing, social, homemaking, and other services on a daily or intermittent basis for an ill or disabled loved one at home. Um, going deeper into that definition, there are many different facets of family caregiving, um, and I'll get into the tasks of them later, but just some bullet points of exactly what family caregiving entails. Um, there's a physical dimension, which is actually physically caring for someone, um, and obviously there are many different types of ways we can physically care for someone, whether it's rolling them in bed or assisting them to the toilet, um, but that's the physical act of caregiving. There's emotional caregiving. So um, caregiving and also being a homebound family member can be very isolating. So that's kind of like the companionship that caregivers provide to their loved ones they're taking care of. Um, there's a psychological component. A lot of this um, really pertains to the, our loved ones who have um, memory issues. So Alzheimer's and dementia, there's a psychological impact of family caregiving there. There's distance caregiving, which has become, become quite common um, in our society today with family members living all around the globe. So that's caring for our family members from a distance, but still being a really important role in their lives. Um, there's medical caregiving. So most of us think medical, you know, is a medical team, a doctor, a nurse, which it is, but sometimes family caregivers take on that role too. And that can be from dispensing medication, 
um, to setting up oxygen tanks, um, to giving morphine at end of life. So medical caregiving is something that sometimes we take on as well as a caregiver, which we really don't ever have training for. Um, there's remote caregiving. So similar to distance caregiving, done at a distance remote caregiving is when we are physically far away from our loved ones and might have to use FaceTime or Zoom um, to set up those doctor's appointments or to meet with an attorney or whatever it uh, is that we have to do um, remote. So a lot of people might not think of that as caregiving, but there are very much is um, some significance in being a remote caregiver. And then there's non-medical care. So again, kind of going back to meeting with attorneys, setting up um, end of life wishes, power of attorney, um, something that we on the hospice side really advocate that caregivers start if they had already while a loved one is still cognitively able to, um, that's all non-medical care. And it's a, a huge part of the caregiving role as well. Um, so some caregiving statistics <clears throat> who are family caregivers. So according to some estimates, 65.7 million Americans, so that's 29% of the adult US population served as family caregivers in 2020. Um, caregiving marital status varies. So about 54% of caregivers are married, 21% are single and never married, 8% are divorced, 7% living with a partner, and 4% widowed, um, with nearly two thirds of family caregivers being employed full or part-time. So on top of being a caregiver, um, most of these caregivers are also working their jobs as well. Um, estimates suggest that the majority of caregivers are female. So 65% of care recipients are female with an average of uh, about 69 and a half years old. So that's the person who's receiving the care. Um, the younger the care recipient, the more likely the recipient is to be male. 45% of care recipients are aged, um, aged 18 to 45 are male and 33% are age, aged 50 or higher are male. So higher hour caregivers, which is 21 hours or more weekly, are nearly four times more likely to be caring for a spouse or a partner. A majority of caregivers being 85% care for a relative or other loved one. So out of that huge number, a, a big majority are caring for a relative or loved one. 42% are caring for a parent with breaking that down, 31% for a mother, 11% for a father. 15% caring for a friend, neighbor, or other non-relative, 14% caring for a child, 7% caring for a parent-in-law, and 7% caring for a grandparent or grandparent-in-law. Um, so further statistics here, a little bit about the money aspect in, in caregiving. 53 million Americans are providing unpaid care for relatives and friends. Um, family caregivers provide an average of 23.7 hours of care each week. Um, this number goes up substantially for those wh whose loved ones live with them, being 37.4 hours per week, making caregiving the equivalent to a full-time job. 47% 47, 47 of working caregivers indicate an increase in caregiving expenses has caused them to use up all or most of their savings. The AARP study in uh, 2020 found that 78% of family caregivers regularly incur out-of-pocket costs caring for a loved one, which is no surprise based on how much we have to do as caregivers, um, with the average yearly cost being $7,200. The value of services family caregivers provide for free has been estimated to be $375 billion a year. So to put that in perspective, because we know the home care and nursing home services are a lot of money as well, um, the unpaid care that caregivers are giving is almost twice as much as money spent on home care and nursing home services combined. Um, and that would be about $158 billion a year. Um, so I talked about it earlier, but breaking down um, the caregiving role into caregiving tasks, um, we have what we call instrumental activities of daily living, IADLs, and then activities of daily living, ADLs. Um, so first, instrumental activities of daily living. Um, these are the activities that allow an individual to live independently in a community, um, whether that's at home or assisted living, wherever, whatever looks like home to them. Um, so this is not necessarily for functional living, but um, the ability to perform these IADLs can improve the quality of life. 
um, and 99% of family caregivers provide help with the IADLs. Um, the most common types that um, family care caregivers provide are transportation assistance. So going to and from doctor's appointments, taking them to the grocery store to get their groceries, um, running up to the pharmacy, um, just that transportation service that a, a family member provides that otherwise the, the patient or loved one could have done for themselves. Um, assistance with grocery shopping takes up 79% of these IADLs. Help with housework, so that's laundry and cleaning and tidying around, um, that's 76%. Meal preparation is 64%. And then also managing finances is that instrumental activity of daily living that caregivers usually take on as our loved ones age or um, get ill. We also have activities of daily living. Um, so these are ADLs and these are necessary for basic functional living. So the ability to live independently, these are fundamental skills that are required to live independently and care for ourselves. Um, so those six main ADLs are personal hygiene and grooming. So the ability to bath ourselves, um, brush our teeth, wipe our face, um, just that basic activity of daily living. Dressing, the ability to get ourselves dressed um, appropriately, get out of our pajamas. Um, toileting, so the ability to walk ourselves to the toilet and um, get that activity done, um, continence, the ability to continue to be able to pass bowels and urinate, um, transferring or ambulating, so the ability to get around the room or the house or to the doctor's appointments, um, and then eating, um, still having an appetite and being able to digest the food. So unlike the instrumental activities of daily living, um, a senior or our loved ones must be able to perform uh, activities of daily living in order to live independently and remain safe in their home environment. So um, when we're, I was on the hospice side, this is something that we often looked at in, in home care is making sure that um, if a patient couldn't perform these ADLs on their own, that they did have a caregiver could, who could help assist with that. Um, so on average, caregivers spend 13 days each month on tasks such as shopping, food preparation, housekeeping, laundry, transportation, and giving medication. Um, six days per month on feeding, dressing, grooming, walking, bathing, and assistance toileting. And 13 hours per month researching care services or information on disease, coordinating physician visits, or managing financial matters. Um, so what does caregiving look like for our future? Um, the estimates show that the number of caregivers will continue to rise, which makes sense as the baby boomers continue to age. Um, currently, there are seven potential family caregivers per adult, but the estimates show that by 2030 is estimated there will be only four potential family caregivers per older adult. 17.2% of middle-aged and older adults who are not currently caregivers expect to provide care or assistance in the next two years to a friend or family member with a health problem or disability. Two-thirds of the U.S. public expects to be caregivers in the future, which is a high number. 43% um, report that's very likely they will become a family caregiver at a future time. Um, so before we get into how we take care of ourselves as caregiver, um, we have to talk about some of the negative impacts of family caregiving. Um, the top one probably being burnout, um, which is the physical and emotional um, health problems that we get from being caregivers, um, just the mental load of everything, um, not being able to take care of ourselves, not actively taking care of ourselves, that's what leads to burnout. Um, isolation, so not only for the patient, but as the caregiver, since that's kind of um, our focus today, it's very isolating to be a caregiver. You spend most of your day with your loved one, um, so you really don't have time to socialize with others. You don't have really a lot of people to talk to, so a negative impact could be the isolation of being a caregiver. Um, like we talked about earlier, there's the financial stress, so of course providing care is expensive, but again, you know, one of my bullet points is that a lot of caregivers have to dip into their own savings as a family caregiver, um, which is a negative impact to many people. And then another tough one can be family conflict. So if you're caring for um, a loved one, a parent, for example, and you have siblings, there can be conflict involved. Many times I've seen in my hospice experience, it's usually about money. Um, while 
the loved one is still alive, it can be related to care, um, signing up for hospice, not signing up for hospice. Either way, the bottom line is there is usually family conflict um, because there's disagreements in care. Um, so digging a little bit deeper into caregiver burnout, um, caregiver burnout is the state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. You're physically burnt out from being the caregiver, being on the clock 24-7. You're emotionally burnt out because you can't feel like you can't give anymore. And you're really trying to, and then mentally exhausted because of the mental load, trying to balance doctor's appointments. And did you cook food for the day? And did they take their medication? And what's next? It's just a lot. The mental load is a lot. Um, over time, caregiver stress can lead to burnout. Uh, marked by irritability, fatigue, problems with sleep, weight gain, feelings of helplessness or hopelessness, and social isolation. Um, caregiver burnout is an example of how repeated exposure to stress harms our mental and physical health. Um, chronic stress triggers the release of our stress hormones in the body, like cortisol, um, which can lead to exhaustion, irritability, a weakened immune system, digestive distress, headaches, and pains. Um, so. Something that can help before we get into self-care, um, how I said that about 13 hours uh, per month is dedicated to caregivers researching things that can help them. Um, I found some cool caregiving tool apps in my own personal research in helping the caregiver. Um, so some of them are called CareZone. Um, this is a free app that lets you use your computer, smartphone, or tablet to organize files, contacts, and medications, coordinate with family members and other caregivers using a shared calendar and journal. Um, I've also seen a lot of people use like messenger apps and making group chats and stuff, but this seems like it gets a little bit deeper into medications, organization, stuff like that. Um, Caring Bridge, it's the free app that allows us to start free privacy protected websites um, where we can share updates, photos, videos. Um, and then we've got a couple more, Rx, Mind Me and MediSafe. Um, MediSafe is through Walgreens and it's medication and reminder apps to track users intake of medication, vitamins, and supplements. This is huge for caregiving and kind of takes away some of the burden, the mental load I was talking about. Um, I used to tell patients to set timers on their phone to remember if their caregiver wasn't um, able to help them in that aspect. Um, but now with technology, these apps are amazing and definitely helpful. There's lots of helping hands, which is a free app for iPhone and iPad only. Um, it's a painless way to organize help and it's central feel features a calendar where you can ask for help. So if you have this chain of people in your support system, you can ask for things like meals, rides to medical appointments, or just companionship visits. Um, and then it also sends reminders and helps coordinate logistics. Um, there's also a few websites here. I'm not going to go into huge detail, but there's benefits checkup. Um, there's Benefits Finder, there's an Elder Care Locator, um, the Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, so this is a really information-packed website, and it goes state by state. Um, so definitely worth digging into that if you need some more help as a caregiver. Um, there's Needy Meds. It's a nonprofit website with um, information and programs to help people who can't afford certain medications. Um, and then the VA caregiver support. So if you're taking care of your loved one who is a veteran, um, you could have some resources and support in that aspect. Um, so now the reason why we're here, caring for the caregiver. Um, so over the course of probably the last three years, I've dedicated a lot of my time and research into studying self-care. Um, and I think at work has I've been proclaimed as like the self-care guru person because I'm really pushing it and the people in my circle are starting to push self-care. It's really important to take care of ourselves. Um, I lack it sometimes. It's important to have these reminders, um, but it's really important as a caregiver caring for a family member to take care of yourself. Um, it's important and it's necessary. Um, it's hard though. So many caregivers feel guilty if they spend too much time on themselves rather than their ill or elderly loved ones, which is totally valid. And I totally get it. That's probably the number one thing I hear or I used to hear in the field, um, helping loved ones take care of their family members on hospice is they just don't have time. This is what they would rather be doing right now is being a caregiver. And I totally get it. And that's so valid. So I'm, I'm not taking anything away from that, but this is just a, cert, a little reminder to try to carve out that time for yourself. Um, it's essential to, um, it's essential to your mental health, your psychological, emotion, emotional and social well-being. 
um, because these aspects have a huge impact on every part of your life. Um, so some early tips for self-care. Try to recognize the warning signs early. So some of those things I was talking about earlier regarding burnout, the irritability, sleep problems, and forgetfulness. Those are some early signs that you need. There's some part of you that needs attention, that we need to take a step back and realize that you're neglecting yourself in some way. Are you more irritable than normal? Are you sleeping too much, sleeping too little? Um, are you forgetting things that otherwise you would be rem remembering? Um, these show me that you're lacking um, some part of self-care for yourself. Um, so try to know your personal warning signs. They differ from person to person for sure. Everyone has different warning signs um, and try to act to make changes before they snowball and, and get worse. Try not to wait until you're overwhelmed um, because when we're overwhelmed, it kind of turns into a different beast. And then it's just like, again, the snowball. Um, by not waiting until you're overwhelmed, you can ask for help, which again is very hard for a caregiver and someone who is always the strong person and taking care of everything. It's really hard to ask for help. Um, try to find someone you trust, such as a friend, a colleague, a neighbor. Um, try to talk to them about your feelings and frustrations, knowing that you're allowed to talk about it. It's healthy to talk about it, and it's good to find somewhere for these feelings to go. Try to set realistic goals. Um, so expectation sometimes ends up making us more disappointed. So if you send realistic goals, you can hopefully tackle this caregiving role easier. Um, so with that, you can accept that you might need help with caregiving. Um, you don't always have to be the strong one and take everything on your shoulders. Identify what you can and cannot change. So this is huge for setting realistic goals you might not be able to change your loved one's diagnosis or their memory issues. Um, so trying to accept and figure out what can be changed and what cannot change. Um, prioritize, make lists and establish a daily routine. Turn to others for help with some tasks if they're willing to take them on. Um, local organizations or places of worship might provide support for caregivers or family members especially those suffering from diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's Association is a wonderful organization. Um, they also might provide respite or allow um, caregiver to have time away from the patient. So if you look into the ability to have respite care, um, try to take that up. Um, with all of these, advocacy is your friend. That's what I always told um, the caregivers caring for my hospice patients. Really, advocacy is huge in, in getting help and setting realistic goals. Um, give yourself permission to take breaks, which is really hard, but it's really important. So try to get out of the house, visit with your friends, pamper yourself with a massage. If you can't afford a massage or that's just not in the budget, just go up to like a Walgreens or Target and get a face mask and that can be your pampering. Um, take a long bath, et cetera. Your break look is unique to you. It looks different for everyone. So try to give yourself that permission to take a break take a breather, um, and then take care of yourself. So stay on top of your own doctor's appointments, try to eat well, which is really hard as a caregiver. Like I talked about, weight gain is probably one of the biggest things we take on as caregivers, but it's really important to try to eat well. Tons of apps for that as well. Um, get enough sleep. So not too much, not too little. And then if exercise is just not in the calendar of your very busy 24 hour day, um, try to walk three times a week for 10 minutes. So bare minimum, if you can't exercise, if you can't have a gym membership, you can't get out of the house. There's also tons of free YouTube videos, just walking videos. So you don't have to do these, you know, high intense workouts, just walking videos too. Um, also with that, there's mind body practices that you can do. So there's yoga, um, tai chi, um, Thursdays at one o'clock, every Thursday at one o'clock, we offer tai chi for caregivers here at Angela Hospice. Um, if the weather permits, it's outdoors um, or like in the winter, it's in the family kitchen. So give us a try and come try, try tai chi, tongue twister. <laughs> um, <clears throat> meditation, um, I'm going, before we start questions and answers, I'm gonna lead us through a guided meditation for caregivers and or deep rel relaxation. So again, with technology, tons of apps for free guided meditations, that could be your break, just stepping aside and doing a guided meditation for 10 minutes and tuning the world out. Um, even though it's hard, you can try to keep up your hobbies. 
Did you like drawing, painting, um, scrapbooking? Whenever you can find time for that, that's just a little spark of joy that can really um, keep up your self-care. Try to remain socially connected. Um, we know this is hard because caregiving is very isolated, um, but if it's very hard to do something in person, there's a lot of online platforms for staying socially connected, especially in the year 2022, all the social media apps, um, caregiver support groups. So really try to find that um, support for yourself and stay socially connected, not dig deeper into the social isolation. Um, give yourself permission to practice self-compassion. This is a huge one um, that I think that human beings in general, let alone caregivers, don't practice enough. Um, so really try to be kind to yourself. Um, allow yourself to feel your feelings. It's really hard being a caregiver. It's really hard watching your loved one decline. It's really hard watching them at end of life. So allow yourself to feel the feelings that come up with it. Try not to let yourself get numb with the whole thing. And then give yourself some credit. The care you give does make a difference. It really makes a difference. Whenever we complimented family members caring for hospice patients at end of life, they really appreciated hearing that and giving just giving them credit. You're doing a really amazing thing um, and you deserve the appreciation for that. Um, and then there's mindfulness and breath awareness. So mindfulness is a really neat um, practice. If you're ever interested in, in looking that up and practicing mindfulness, again, there's tons of apps for it. There's relaxation recordings and you can also practice affirmations. Um, which are really cool. They're like mantras. So finding an affirmation that works for you, like I can do hard things and sticking to an affirmation and saying it to yourself over and over again, putting it on sticky notes, putting it around your house while you're caring for your loved one. Um, research shows that it does help rewire our brains in a positive way. So try to affirm yourself and set those affirmations for yourself. Um, so that leads me here to into our guided mindfulness meditation. Um, it's from the VA caregiver support. Um, so I'm going to go into our meditation here. To begin, I will ask that you are seated in a comfortable position with your body supported and your legs uncrossed. Place your feet on the floor and rest your hands in your lap or on your thighs. Whether you are seated or lying down, Take a moment to notice the feeling of support for your body against the surface you are on. If you would like to remove visual distractions and if it is safe to do so, you can close your eyes. Keep your mouth gently closed, not clenched, and let your tongue lightly touch the roof of your mouth. Breathe through your nose, unless for some reason you aren't able. When you're settled in, we will start by taking a few deep cleansing breaths. Deep into your belly and then exhale slowly. Breathe in deeply and exhale slowly. Now, without trying to control your breath in any way, allow it to find its natural rhythm and depth. Bring your attention to the rising and falling of your belly as you breathe. You are just featuring your breath as a focus of attention. You are simply following your breath as you would a child with watchful attention. You don't have to do anything fancy, just pay attention to your breath. Observe the natural movement, feeling the air coming into your nose, your lungs expanding, belly rising, the gentle pause, and then exhale. It knows what to do all on its own. You don't have to force it or control it in any way. Follow your breath lovingly, and with attention in and out. As it rests in between breaths, relax and trust that it will resume. There are no expectations. There are no worries. You don't have to do it perfectly. We are just noticing and following our breath. You may notice your mind wandering or finding your thoughts may float through, distracting your attention from the focus of your breath. This will happen. This is what our thoughts will do. Maybe you're thinking of what you have to do next. Maybe you're restless. It's okay. Our thoughts, like waves in the ocean, will rise and pass. No need to control your thoughts or make them go away. Just observe them. Then guide your attention back to featuring the awareness of your breath. No need to force anything. Simply pay attention. If thoughts float through like the waves in the ocean, gently notice them and let them pass. 
that you can let go of planning and doing right now. There's nowhere to be and nothing to do. Just for this time, you can let go and follow the natural movement of your breath. Drop into the place of calm and quiet that is there beneath the surface of the ocean waves. There's a place of rest and calm for you beneath the surface. Give yourself over to the quiet awareness of this moment that is found in focusing on your breath. If there is a heaviness or sadness in your heart, if there is anger or criticism, if there is worry or anxiety that comes into your awareness, observe these feelings with kindness and care. Observe these feelings with kindness and care. No need to cling to any distress or push anything away. Simply acknowledge the feelings that rise to the surface of your attention. Be aware of them and return your attention to the simple, peaceful comfort of the natural rise and fall of your breath. There is a deep calm and wisdom that you invite with this kind and gentle attention to the present moment, to the focused attention to your natural breath. You may return again and again, if you wish, to this place of restoration. Your breath is always available for you as a touchstone for your attention to the present. You may return again and again as a kind and gentle act of self-love. Now, begin to slowly bring your attention back to your surroundings and as you are ready, you may open your eyes. We'll take a few moments for our minds and bodies to come back to our surroundings. Take a few minutes. How did this feel for you? Was it difficult to keep the attention to your breath? This is natural. It's a practice to develop this attention. Did you become aware of thoughts, feelings, or physical sensations that you have been unaware of? Did this focus on your breath bring some measure of calm? In practice, Mindfulness meditation has the capacity to bring greater clarity and compassion for ourselves and others as we develop our capacity to bring a non-judging kindness and acceptance to the present moment. Mindfulness can help to bring balance and perspective back into our daily lives. Um, thank you for being with me in that guided meditation. I have a couple of infographics here, which I love to insert into all the presentations I give. Um, so the first one here is five more self-care tips for family caregivers, um, digging deeper into the very specific types of self-care, um, listening to music, journaling your thoughts, putting, putting them on paper is really healing, um, waving to a neighbor or walking the dog there, trying to find a patch of sunshine as we embark in these dark months, um, decluttering your drawer, getting rid of things that don't spark joy anymore. And then five other ways to practice self-care. Nurturing your spirit above all else. Again, choosing that self-kindness. Rest whenever you can. Move whenever you can. Choose life-giving foods. And five, simply just breathe. Um, thanks everyone for sitting through my presentation here on caring for the caregiver. Really appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back to Jennifer um, with any questions or anything else today. Great. Thank you so much, Nikki. I know that uh, I was very uh, relaxed and in, in my own space, so I appreciate that uh, exercise there at the end. Um, I'll, I'll allow everyone to unmute yourself, uh, to come out of the relaxed state that Nikki put us in, and uh, ask any questions. Um, there have been a couple direct questions to me, Nikki, but I want to um, make sure everyone has an opportunity to unmute yourself. You can either ask the correction, excuse me, the question directly to Nikki, or you can put it in the chat, and I will share that with her. Uh, the one question, one of the questions that we had, Nikki, was from, and you mentioned in your presentation about um, making sure you're taking self care of yourself, and this individual said that. She's caring for her mother, um, but she's beginning to wonder if she should seek uh, more professional assistance and no longer do it just herself, and was wondering if you could speak or give some general uh, thoughts on how to identify when too much is too much and she needs to have some professional assistance aside from herself. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think there's different ways to decide um, when you feel like you need more help. Um, kind of going back to the part where I was talking about the early morning signs. So if you feel yourself becoming emotionally, physically, 
um, and mentally burnt out um, or all three or just one of them, I think that's a clear indication that you, you need more help um, and it's okay to ask for the help. And if finances allow it, um, I really would encourage to get that extra help. And many times, especially when I was in home care, um, we would tell family members, just start, start small, um, maybe just hire someone a few hours a week um, and see how that goes and see how the balance starts to shift. And then as you become comfortable with the caregiver or an organization, start to add more help. Um, so it's not all on just the caregiver's plate. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nikki. Again, you can unmute yourselves, um, ask Nikki any questions directly, um, or you can, of course, um, reach out and ask directly through the chat. Um, while I uh, let people get used to un unmuting themselves, just a couple points of interest, you can contact um, Nikki or uh, members of her team uh, here at Angela Hospice, the best way to reach um, our team members is to visit our, web our website, which of course is askforangela.com. Um, and we um, invite you to visit our website as well as our social media sites on Facebook, et cetera, to find out more information. Our next uh, Angela Answers is December 21st. Uh, we will have Heather Dean, who is a music therapist with Angela Hospice, and she'll be directing and having a presentation on the importance of music therapy. Uh, but right now, Nikki, I did get another question, and they wanted to know uh, when they when they're being when let me rephrase here. She says that when she is providing care for her family. She often feels that she gets drawn into the drama of her family and asked if you had any specific thoughts about how to differentiate and put that separation between her family drama and providing the care and keeping herself sane in this process. Yeah, that is a good question. And the first and probably biggest thing that comes to my mind for that is boundaries. Um, we talk a lot about boundaries um, in my role in the grief department here because it's really important to set boundaries, um, even with family members, which I think it, it's a lot harder to set um, boundaries with family members. But it's really important, um, especially if there is that drama, not only to hopefully keep the peace with the family, but also to protect your mental health. Um, so it could look differently. It could be just gently saying um, I'm taking care of mom right now. Um, please let's not talk about that right now. Or it can be reminding them, you know, I have a lot on my plate. Can we, you know, this isn't what's really Im important to me right now is this drama. Um, finding whatever it looks like for you, basically just setting that boundary um, to protect your mental health again and to hopefully keep the peace with the family. Um, yeah, that's the biggest thing I would suggest is finding the boundaries that work for you and, and um, instilling them into the dialogue between you and your family. Excellent. Again, thank you so much, Nikki. Just a reminder, as we close out this edition of Angela Answers, we do have a children's holiday workshop that's being conducted by our grief care department, and that will be Sunday, December 4th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, again, you can find out information about this grief care workshop on askforangela.com, as well as starting Friday, we'll have our annual Tree of Life event here on the grounds of Angela Hospice. Uh, this is an honor, a way for you to remember a loved one uh, during the holiday season on uh, during our Tree of Life event on the grounds of Angela Hospice. Come visit us, uh, see the beautiful winter wonderland, and, and pay reverence and remembrance to loved ones that are no longer with us. Again, uh, next Angela Answers is December 21st at 1 p.m. and it's Music Matters, the importance of music therapy presented by our musical music therapist, Heather Dean. And uh, Nikki, I want to again, thank you so much for a very insightful and thought provoking presentation on caring for the caregivers. Again, as a reminder, this video, this is being recorded and will be downloaded within 10 days to our website where you will be able to share it with your friends and loved ones and refer back to it often. 
Again, thank you so much for joining us on behalf of the entire staff and the community at Angela Hospice. We wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday if you choose to celebrate that way. And we'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday, December 21st. Thanks so much, folks. Have a great day. Thank you.